This is Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Let's talk about the F word. I mean, feminism. Obviously, we're not going to sit down and debate whether women deserve equal rights. They do. And in a lot of ways, this is a really good time to be a woman in America. We have a female vice president. The gender pay gap is still significant, but getting smaller. And it has been since 1979. More women are able to pursue higher education than ever before. Even look at last week's Iowa caucuses, where Donald Trump lost one county, and a Republican woman, Nikki Haley, was the candidate who won it. Of course, that's not the whole story. We're also seeing restrictions on reproductive rights, a hostile political climate, and intersectional issues that hurt black and brown women the most. So if we're still fighting for equality of the sexes, why do some women feel like feminism is failing? Why are so many young women in America marching and committing civil disobedience to so many issues that have little to do with American women's rights? Phyllis Chesler, feminist scholar and writer, joins us to argue that feminism is dying, but that it can be saved. Stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Honeysuckle White. If you're looking for ways to make mealtime healthier in the new year, make your favorite recipes with turkey from Honeysuckle White. Take the pressure off. Keep it simple and tasty without sacrificing flavor for nutrition. Whether you want a delicious sandwich or post-workout protein, Honeysuckle White Turkey can do it all. Visit HoneysuckleWhite.com for recipe inspiration and to find retailers near you. Honeysuckle White. Eat what you love. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Feminism is one of those words that causes a lot of people to bristle, both males and females. Part of that is because there are a lot of misconceptions out there about what feminism is, what it means. Some people do still picture man-hating, bra-burning stereotypes. And for what it's worth, here's the official definition of the word. Feminism, a belief in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes that all genders deserve equal rights and opportunities. But there's another layer of complication, at least one other layer. Even if we were all to suddenly agree on this definition, and that's not a given, how do we, as imperfect human beings, work toward equality in significant ways? There are those who argue that the modern feminist movement is not working because it requires women to fit into a progressive political box. And if you are not progressive, you are automatically anti-feminist. Our guest today argues the feminist movement is dying and needs real retooling. If it really wants to lift all women up, then it needs to change. Our guest is Phyllis Chesler, an author and second wave feminist thinker. Welcome. Glad to be with you. Well, I am a feminist. I am a radical feminist, second wave style. And feminism, like every major kind of philosophy and movement, evolves. It changes. It also disappears the work of foremothers. So we know that feminist knowledge has been systematically disappeared century after century, decade after decade. So the feminism that I pioneered and represent and believe in is no more. That is what's dead. For example, I have a question. Why are so many young women in America uh, marching and committing civil disobedience for so many issues that have little to do with American women's rights. They're out there for climate change, for animal rights, for trans rights, for prison reform, anti-colonialism, anti-capitalism, the rights of women in other countries uh, who are indeed oppressed by their own leaders. Why are they not protesting the loss of Roe? I mean, in numbers equal to all the ongoing demonstrations, or protesting rape, which we worked on, and some change, some improvement, but not really. We can talk about that. Okay, so um, let me slow us down just a little bit, because I want to make sure you're not losing me and we're not losing our listeners here. You're saying, it sounds to me, um, that you were really active and passionate about a certain type of feminism, something that people have called second wave feminism, which was a description of, of the 
the vast majority of feminist advocates during the 1960s and up to the 1990s. Um, we are, some say we're in the fourth wave of feminism, but some say third wave. Either way, it, you know, if you look at any uh, movement, whether that be uh, rights for uh, non-white people, for black and brown people, whether that be rights for laborers, um, what's happening in a, a protest movement 50 years later is never the same as it was uh, in, in, in an older generation. That's exactly what I would say is, of course, feminism is different now. And, and I would say that there are really good arguments for why animal rights um, are a feminist issue, why um, intersectionality is re is necessary for feminism so that it doesn't, it, that it's not what it was so often in our past, which is a movement dominated by white women. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. We didn't say intersectional, but we said working class, um, women of color, we all did all those disabled women, vegetarians, we did the whole thing. We just didn't coin one word for it. Uh, homophobia, we were all over all these issues. And in the beginning, we were mainly white women, middle class women, educated women. And we tried, because I know it, we tried so hard to include women of color. And many joined us, but many chose to work only with other women of color or on behalf of essentially male issues first. And so I agree that all these other, and I'm going back to the 70s. I'm not in the 80s. I'm not in the 90s yet. So um, let's just look at, I, I don't disagree about these other issues being important. I, certainly not. I do wonder that the kind of activism that I've been involved with, uh, which meant speak outs and sit-ins, all for, for example, the rights of mothers, the rights of women, both not to bear children against their will, but once they chose to do so, the issues of divorce, custody, child support, my generation of feminists barely dealt with. I was among a handful. And my generation did look at evils done to women of color, sterilization against their will without their knowledge, on it being used as guinea pigs, certainly in Puerto Rico, elsewhere, and as a founder of the National Women's Health Network and the Association for Women in Psychology, co-founder, of all of these issues are out there and were at the beginning. Now, of course, they've gained necessarily great attraction. But I want to go back. I mean, I've just been involved in a grassroots feminist effort of many generations of American women who rescued 400 Afghan women. Now, I don't know the kind of performance of virtue, the calling out of injustice wherever. It's not the same as doing this heavy lifting. I'd like to see more heavy lifting. You mean... Um, you are distinguishing between what you did going and helping to rescue Afghan women with talk. I mean, I, I, I feel like we can both agree that, yes, that yes. acting is better than just talking. Yes. Talking is needed, but uh, action needs to accompany talk. We can no, agree no. on that. Yeah, no, I, I, I was part of, I was privileged since I was once held captive in Kabul when my ally in London, a Sikh woman, Mandy Sangara, said, do you want to help uh, rescues of the Afghan women, I said I'd been waiting my whole life for this opportunity. And it meant sleeplessness, day and night grunt work, putting together a team. Um, someone could get planes. Someone could get medical and other and food into and out of Afghanistan. I mean, now this is not sexy. This doesn't make the news. This is not a protest in the public square. This is behind the scenes work when our government refused to do it. But that's that, that's still happening. That's not unique to second wave feminists. Uh, current no, no, feminists. I didn't say these were others. Yeah. No, I was the oldest one. No, no, these yeah. were women in their 50s, their 40s, maybe even in their upper 30s. 
Okay. So no, this wasn't happening. It's just that so many second wave feminists have died, are now very seriously disabled, uh, don't have the wheel with all to keep on keeping on. And yes, of course, some other women who are feminists have picked up the burden, but there are too few doing the heavy lifting. Can we possibly agree on that? We don't have to. I mean, I, I, I think in insofar as feminism means uh, all the gender equality, um, I think everyone should be a feminist. So to that extent, yes, there are too few. If, oh. if somebody is not a feminist, it means they don't believe in gender equality. And why? Why would you think? Yeah, male supremacy is not okay. On the other hand, I will say that, you know, as a journalist, I have covered so many organizations that have cropped up and and made partnerships, uh, partnerships between the women who organized the Women's March, for example. And when they realized that uh, uh, women of color felt excluded, they reached out and formed partnerships with the Black Lives Matter movement and are doing things that are important. There are ones that uh, there are groups that have specific initiatives. For example, there's a number of them. Uh, Gina Davis's organization, for example, that focus on media and it's needed. Uh, I saw the recent survey that showed that for films between 2010 and 2013, less than a third of speaking characters for women were women. That means almost 70 percent of speaking characters are male in our films. Oh, now. yeah. Yeah. So there are I mean, even though it may be difficult to see because they don't always get coverage, there are lots of organizations that are focusing in on one particular part of the feminist movement, one particular specific thing that they where they want to see change. All right, give me an example then. I mean, one of the failures of my generation was uh, the sexual revolution, which was for boys, not for girls, really. And the failure to look at the realities of motherhood, biological motherhood chosen. And um, a hostility to biological motherhood, a fear of it, uh, contempt for it. So I see, I take that into the current moment. And I'm always so upset, maybe it's my age, when I see celebrity girls and women half naked on the catwalk, on the runway, accompanied by male celebrities who are fully dressed. Now, is this my age speaking or is it my feminism speaking? I can't answer that for you, um, but I'm going to respond uh, as soon as we come back. We need to take a break, uh, and then we'll continue this conversation. I'm Celeste Headley. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate, and we will return. How do you feel great on vacation? Like, really good? Easy. You go to Aruba. You'll spend your time relaxing on cool white sand beaches and floating in healing blue water. You'll immerse yourself in natural wonder and find your center on an island where things move at your speed. You won't just feel great, you'll feel relaxed, renewed, and ready for life. That's the Aruba Effect. Plan your trip at aruba.com. The history of HIV and AIDS is the history of people who were told to stay out of sight and who refused to do so. Gay men, but also injection drug users, women and, yes, children who contracted the virus. Join host Kai Wright for Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows, a new series that seeks to answer the question of how much pain could have been avoided had we paid attention sooner. From the History Channel and WNYC Studios, Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows. Listen wherever you get podcasts. We're back. Thanks for staying with us. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. I am Celeste Headley, and we're talking about whether or not feminism is dying with Phyllis Chesler, who actually wrote a book called The Death of Feminism. Not my title. Didn't choose it. <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah, I'm not great at making yeah. titles either. But in any case, before we took a break, you asked me whether it was your age or your feminism that feels uncomfortable when you see, say, a, a female model walking down the catwalk and she's barely dressed. You can oftentimes you can see every part of her body and and males are fully dressed. Um, I would say that um, 
there are plenty of occasions in which men are not fully dressed. On the other hand, I also agree that for some reason, the draw, the line in the sand for society seems to be male genitalia. Like you cannot display male genitalia. It's okay to display yeah. women. Vaginas everywhere and boobs even more places. But for some reason, the sacred penis must be hidden at all costs. There we agree. But I don't think, I, I, do, I think that if, uh, if women are being forced to show their body in order to be employed, that's a feminist issue. But if women enjoy showing their body, then it's not a feminist issue anymore. Then feminism says they should be allowed to make their own choices. Look, my position was we should be allowed to walk out naked at high noon in the public square without Absolutely. risking being... Because there's the whole free the nipple No, no, wait uh, a minute. Movement. Without risking being treated like sluts, and yes. for having it justify rape. And this is also true among <clears throat> prostituted women. So it's not as if I'm like anti-sex or phobic about nakedness. No, I just look at the real life consequences, which are horrifying, even when women are veiled and are nuns, not to mention their skirts being too, quote, short, which is traditionally used against us in rape trials if there even are, and even though we did, the, I, I, I did the keynote at the first ever in the world speak out on rape, 1971, it made little difference in terms, well, no, there's been some progress for sure, but most rapes are not reported, most rapes are not prosecuted, most rape sentences are minimal, and as the Atlantic covered a couple of years ago, 20 years went by before rape kits were processed, which meant that the women never saw justice, the victims, men, old women, and the predators were free to, to strike again. So here's where I have to jump in and, and um, refer back to the idea that um, conservative women are not welcome within the feminist movement, which is part of an argument whenever people talk about feminism dying. And here, I'm gonna push back on that just a little bit because, for example, the Violence Against Women Act, which is absolutely imperfect, I would agree with that, but it is aimed at addressing domestic violence, sexual assault, treating stalking as a serious crime, as it should be. It expired in 2018 because of Republican opposition. It was just renewed in 2022 for five years. I'm with years, you. But I'm with you on this. On so many issues, Roe v. Wade, abortion access, the the standards of feminism trying to reach gender equality is opposed by people on the conservative side. And I think that may be what created this idea that f to be feminist, you have to be progressive. I don't think that's true. But in the United States, at least, the conservative party opposes so many of the efforts that feminists are trying to reform. And yet, while I agree with you, there are so many examples of judges who are conservatives, even Republicans, who are excellent on domestic... Oh, agreed. Agreed. So I think we have to find allies on each issue. We shouldn't vet people on all issues, and if they disagree with us on one we shame them, blame them, name them, and never talk to them again. That kind of division is one of the problems that we're facing as a country right now. So if conservatives, Republicans, independent libertarians want to work against rape, want to work against domestic violence, that means legislation as well as economics, I'm happy to include them, you know, and so should everyone else be. If we're dealing with, I mean, but how could smart feminists, and there are so many, underestimate the uh, power of our opposition on the issue of women's reproductive freedom? How could we not have believed that we could lose Roe? And how could we not have in every way been prepared? The answer is we were what? Uh, misinformed, lazy. Uh, took it for granted. I don't know, but you know, vigilance is the price of freedom. And we didn't pay attention. And now I don't see a huge outcry among women and men about the Dobbs decision. I would like much more. Oh, really? Yes. I have seen a 
ass about, okay, I'm going to, I have to push back on that because if you look at so many of the recent elections, there were midterm elections, state level elections, and any political strategist, even conservatives, will say that one of the main reasons that Republicans have so, done so badly in recent elections when they should have performed well is because of the anger of women over the Dobbs decision, that the issue of abortion has even activated conservative women and they have expressed a great deal of frustration with their own party. Yes, but you mentioned Black Lives Matter, and they, as I, from my point of view, they did take over the Women's Issues, Women's March, turning it into something else. But granted, fine. I don't see us in the streets the way Black Lives Matter were, have been. Why not? Over this issue and over the upcoming madness of losing the abortion hittle and all of the stuff that's happening in Texas. We should be, and some of us are, uh, launching all kinds of legislation and also taking to the streets, not to harass individuals at home or where they're eating, which is a bad look, but yeah, it's, protest. I mean, you're a, they're a public figure. They can be harassed. You know, well, that, that I get harassed in my daily life. Difference. Yeah, I guess so, because I get, you know, I'm a journalist. I get harassed all the time. <laughs> so I, I feel like it's fair play. But well, I will like say. So why? <laughs> but they haven't yet I, come to my door. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but they do come to other people's doors. But in any case, that's a, that's a little bit of a tangent. But I will say that uh, there have been massive protests uh from reproductive rights advocates. Some of them have been among the largest protests in American history. They don't last. Um, They're limited. Well, no protest Stop. lasts. People have to go back to, to work. But not only have people been going to the streets and protesting, in June we saw a, a massive protest in a number of cities, uh, Washington, New York, Atlanta, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, women and men out in the streets. But they have followed that up with action in the voting booths where they have um, caused people to lose elections that in former years they would have won. And again, political analysis shows that the Dobbs decision was a major factor in these recent elections. Let me remind so us I can't how this that began. It was Joe Biden who basically assisted Clarence Thomas and uh, uh, disparaged Anita Hill in the hearings about his uh, yeah, sexual agreed. conduct. Yeah, he apologized for that. It doesn't matter. It happened. I, and it's I agree. Consequences. It, it, <laughs> now, agreed. again, we can't be held liable for things, all the bad things we've done in the past, although both sides of the aisle have been excelling in doing that. Yes. That's another, that's another discussion. And what would you say the issue of pornography, prostitution, and trafficking or let's start with the sexual harassment. The Me Too movement, brilliant, long overdue. But you know what? It only brought down famous rich men in the entertainment areas. What about in the agricultural fields and the factories, secretaries and offices and around the world? Because there was a lot of online uh, activity about at Me Too in every, on every continent. And it went nowhere. It's like a great idea without enough legs, without enough power. So is it enough? I have to ask, is it enough for us to bring down known men, but not union leaders and uh, not bosses in small offices or supermarkets? I don't know. So we have we have found another place of agreement here, Phyllis, because I 100 percent agree with you. But in that case, I don't think that was the fault of feminists. Um, I think that there was a almost an immediate backlash against Me Too because we immediately heard from people who saying these poor men, even those who were held accountable, were being canceled. And why should people want them to lose their livelihood? We heard even the worst actors being defended. And then there was a whole backlash against cancel culture. I don't think the, the if Me Too didn't go far enough, I don't think it was the fault of the feminists. I think it was the fault of our society, which is absolutely anti-feminist and anti-women. Anti-women. But this was yeah. the case before we spoke up and began to make something of a difference. And it's also women, not just men, 
who support male predators for a variety of reasons, beginning I absolutely agree. incest families, which I've written about. Mothers will cover for their paycheck and will exile their daughters who are the victims in all kinds of ways. So this problem, our society, is not only due to women. It's due to a patriarchal um, tradition of sexism internalized by both men and women, structures that support it. Um, and there is no area of political uh, belief that is free of misogyny, none. And there 100% are 100% agree. But that's true in so many things. I mean, you'll find that that's why we systemic racism is the real problem as opposed to individual racist. I mean, pretty much every civil rights issue, you're going to have people who uh, don't vote in their best interests and have ter- internalized the stereotypes about them. We're going to continue this conversation. There's a lot to talk about here, but we do have to take a break. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. We'll talk more about whether or not feminism is dying out in just a moment. And we're back. I'm Celeste Headley, and this is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. Now, we could talk about this for a very long time, Phyllis, and I enjoy the discussion. Um, but in the time that we have left, I, I, I want to go back to this idea that uh, feminism is, is dying, because I could not disagree with that more. I think feminism is changing, um, the movement anyway, but I think in many ways it's getting stronger. And I will say this, I mean, as a black Jewish woman... Um, whose ancestors were feminists going back to emancipation, but were shut out of, say, the suffrage movement because they were black. Um, I think that the feminism that we're seeing today, which is more aware of differences, which is more intersectional, which is more inclusive, I think that's a much stronger feminism than the feminism of Susan B. Anthony. Okay, wait, well, their, their limitation was only 60 years to get the vote which at the end of the day was less important than they thought and maybe in our hands could be more important. By the way, sometimes in some elections, I have walked in and voted for Susan B. Anthony for the presidency when all other options were just too horrendous or difficult. You're right. Racism is systemic. So is sexism. Yeah. Yeah, One is not more important than the other. One is not more privileged in terms of our attention. And I agree, you know, my book, Mothers on Trial, begins with the story of a slave mother who actually is Harriet Brent Jacobs, who escaped. And why did I start a book about custody battles and male ownership of children? Is because, indeed, slave owners own the children born of their raping uh, their female slaves. And that is the model for the custody battles that feminists in my time refuse to understand because they thought it's only fair, equal rights, let men have custody when women never had that right. Never. And then it was only, that's a whole other story. Yeah, we only have a few minutes left. So I want to bring us back to um, sort of the kind of the the traditional pinnacles, pillars of feminist movement. And that's things like literacy, more than two years, two thirds of the world's illiterate people are are women. Things like um, safety and um, supporting uh, measures to protect women from sexual assault and sexual harassment. Men are also victims of that, but it's mostly women. Things like uh, gender pay equity. Women make, on the on average, 82 cents for every dollar that men earn. Still, Latinos no. only make 58 cents. Black women only make 63 cents. So if you and I can agree on those things, um, isn't it better for us as two feminists to, to find those uh, issues on which we absolutely agree and work toward them together rather than um, focusing in on these issues on which we're not going to agree and it therefore makes the movement fall apart? Uh, I agree with you, but we also need to focus on getting an equal rights amendment and on when the Violence Against Women Act was active, there were very few beds funded in domestic violence shelters across the country. And so then the act ended and things got a bit worse. They would have to be massively funded. And at a moment when we're facing 
so many other problems, including what to do with immigrants who need to be educated, housed, and fed, and given medical care when we're not even giving it to our indigenous citizens who may be homeless or jobless. So I agree that we work on what we can work on together. Uh, but I also think, and I write, <laughs> and I can't help looking at things that I personally can't work on anymore or at this time. And I think everyone uh, must do the same. Yes. I mean, I again, I think the feminist movement now is is better. Um, I know Susan B. Anthony is, is an icon, and she she achieved a lot, but she ended up opposing the Fifteenth Amendment. Um, so when she was talking about earning the vote, she wasn't fighting for the for my right to vote. She was fighting for yours. But that's she was another discussion. A, Absolutely she, different information. Uh, but she's important. a feminist icon. Important. She's a feminist icon. Well, she's not my icon. I don't think oh, okay. I have any. Maybe, maybe um, I'd give you a list of others. In fact, okay, in, that's fair. Okay, in in letters to a young feminist, I have a bibliography at the back, and I recommend it highly. I mean, I'll send you a copy free. You don't have to buy it. And um, there are many serious thinkers and activists, um, not just Susan B. Anthony. That's fair. Um, we can agree on on not making her an icon. Um, but we'll have to end it there, even though I, I agree that, I mean, I, I really think this conversation could keep going and I'm enjoying it. Um, Phyllis, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. I appreciate all of your energetic questions and ideas. I really do. This was a conversation where I was never going to fully agree with our guest. And that happens sometimes. When you disagree, you'll find you learn a lot more when you give up on the idea of convincing somebody else or changing their mind. Uh, in this conversation, as in many of them, it sometimes gets a little tense because we care about the subject matter. But that's how we learn to hear each other. We want to know how you felt about this conversation, about what Phyllis had to say, and we hope you email us with your thoughts. It's hearmeout at slate.com. Speaking of tense conversations, we are still getting buckets of emails about our conversation in defense of the Trump voter. Our guest, Frank Buckley, got a lot of you thinking, and we're glad about that. Please keep your thoughts coming. But before we go, we want to share another piece of listener mail about that episode. This note is from a listener named Lori, who wrote in part that Trump voters do not care about what happened between November 3rd, 2020 and January 6th, 2021 in the Trump White House is a moral issue that your Eisenhower Republican guest failed to address. The fact that they believe Trump's delusion that he really won by a landslide is justification for his actions is a further cause for concern. It isn't just that Trump voters believe things that are wrong, and they believe many things that are wrong, but also that they simply do not care about the franchise, the Constitution, or the legal and peaceful transition of power as much as they care about money and culture. Bring F.H. Buckley back and discuss this moral failure with him. As an American, I have no interest in indulging Trump voters by politely accepting the importance of their misguided priorities. Our predecessors were willing to die for elected representation in government and later on for the freedom of all human beings. The least I can do is protect them. Thank you for that, Lori. It, it, such a thoughtful response. And believe me, we got a lot of email that was thoughtful and kind and interesting. We are working on having more conversations on this very topic, especially as we get closer to the 2024 election. Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts as always. It is Hear Me Out at Slate.com. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate. The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Until next time, speak your mind but keep it open.